Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the virtual plant clinic. I am Lily Browning. I am Dr. Lester's regular co-host, as he loves to call me. And um, Dr. Lester is not able to be here this morning. He is uh, teaching Master Gardeners from another county. So he asked me to uh, take over for today, and he asked one of his own master gardeners, Bernie Bathauer, he's here with us today. Bernie has been a master gardener for, what, 16 years, something like that? Yeah, 16, so that means you should be getting your 15 year pin. <laughs> um, Bernie and I actually took the same class in 2005. So I've gone through master gardener training and then something told me, hey, you should learn more and go to college. Don't know why that happened. But anyway, welcome everybody. Bernie is, um, he has, like I said, he's been a master gardener. Good morning, buddy from Tallahassee. See, I told you we had Leon County people coming, <laughs> Bernie. Um, Bernie has been a master gardener all the way through for all of these years. Came Comes in every single Thursday. It's taken about a year off though. He was a bit of a slacker. I don't know what happened there during that that year <laughs> that they wouldn't let you in the building, huh? Yeah. 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 Um, but he's back. He came back as soon as um, he was able to. So we're going to test his memory, just make sure see if he hasn't forgotten anything in the <laughs> past year. Um, said I know Bernie very well. We took the class together and I worked at Extension until like 2009. So every Thursday, all day long, Bernie was right there with me and we learned a whole lot together. And then I moved on to different things and Bernie has continued to learn and I still use him when I can't figure <laughs> things out. So if you come up with a question that neither of us can uh, answer right away, I'm going to leave phone number here oh, if I do it right 754-4433 um, apparently I'm William Lester okay <laughs> I'm William Lester today <laughs> oh, that's the phone number where you can reach oh and uh, uh, I think there's a little mouse in the corner behind us doing the same thing here, listening in. This is probably Teresa. So there's our phone number. Well, extensions phone number. Bernie's going to be there every Thursday, at least for six hours. He told me if he doesn't get enough phone calls by 3.30, he's out of there. So give him calls. <laughs> Keep him busy. Even if um, you're listening in from not Hernando County and you have a question, that he needs to think about or research, give him a call. You know, he, one thing Bernie does not like and that's to be bored. So let's make sure he's not bored today. Come up with some really difficult questions here. Let's really put um, his knowledge to the test. Let me see if I can share a little bit of things with you. Um, Share screen. Oh, it's not working right. It never works. Let's do application window. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see that? Can you see that, Bernie? Yes. All right. Since um, Dr. Lester asked me to host, I'm always going to remind you of the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And this is a program that's all over the state. So wherever you are in Florida, these principles apply to you. And everything I teach is going to come back to one or more of these principles every time. And um, been really stretched in this past year since I've been offering a class every single week. But we've gotten really creative and I've had a lot of fun and there are just many ways to talk about these nine principles. So if you have any questions about any of them, go ahead and put it in the chat. If you ask, want to know what that means. Here is something, I'll test Bernie. 
I was sent a picture of this. It was in, it's in Hernando County. Somebody I know asked me what they have. It was growing of its own accord. You know, off the top of your head, Bernie? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, I was looking at it and the thing I do, my first reaction, like on the surface of my brain is always, I don't know, but there's something in the back of my brain coming up with some phrase or something that somewhere in there in some file rate way back there it's trying to tell me so what i'm teaching myself is to listen to that inner voice and something was telling me something about a mock orange which i know is a common name to many plants but i researched that and i think this is what we came up with not a pittosporum that is also called a mock orange this because the leaves looked kind of citrusy to me maybe that's why it, it popped in my head it's also called an english dogwood it is neither citrus nor dogwood um and it is called philadelphus in odorous because some of them smell fantastic so i hear but this one doesn't just looks pretty so that's what I found out that my friend has in her yard, this um, scentless mock orange. And um, at least that's what I figure that it is. She asked me if she could transplant it. I told her to wait until it stops blooming and take a piece and root it in a pot. That way, if it doesn't work, she hasn't lost the entire plant. And see if it, you know, she can propagate it other places. Okay, Bernie, do you know what this seductive invader is here? No. See, that, the, the problem is I'm not really great at <laughs> identifying the plants. What I'm really good at is if you have a disease or a bug uh, or you have grass or if you actually have citrus, those things uh, I'm, I'm pretty decent at. Okay, well, I didn't know this either. Off, with a year off, it's not easy to, to pick these things up no that's true well i did not know this either this was a total surprise to me someone i know on facebook um said she was out for a bike ride and came across the most wonderful tree she thought it was a lilac tree and of course that rang bells with me like what <laughs> you know there's, there's no lilacs here. And she has another friend that you know very well, Bernie. Her name is Donna. <laughs> she also used to work at the extension office. And Donna kind of said, um, I don't really think you have a lilac. And Donna actually came up with that it is a china berry, which is an invasive exotic tree. I had no idea that they bloomed, let alone bloomed so beautifully and smelled so wonderful. Like lilacs, they say. The problem is, again, it's an invasive exotic. So we explained that to our friend. And then her next comment was she thinks she would go and get a piece and start try to grow it in her yard. <laughs> yeah. So we went through another... <laughs> explanation of why that was not a good idea and let me move here if i had had this i would have showed this to her i'm going to use this from now on this is the problem with invasive exotics if you think what's the problem with them they spread in areas beyond your yard in which you may never know so we're, we start with a plant and a plant is the producer in an ecosystem these invasive exotics have no natural checks and balances here. So the native plants die out because the invasive exotic took over its area because nothing is eating it, nothing is, you know, it doesn't get any diseases. So then we'll just say any insect, some insects are very host specific. So if their native plant is not there, they're not going to eat it or they won't have it to eat. They could die then on up the chain, a bird that ate the grasshopper, snake that ate the bird, bird of prey that ate the snake, 
all of those things suffer in an ecosystem because we have displaced natural plant communities. There are no bad plants. There's no such thing as a bad plant. The universe didn't create bad plants. Um, who brought the plants here, Bernie? Who brought the plants in places where they don't belong? <laughs> Did the plants self move? Oh, no. The, <laughs> the uh, seeds are moved by the wind. They're moved by other animals. Uh, they're moved by people that you don't know. Uh, that, uh, your neighbor came in and, and put one in and, and thought it was really pretty and it ought to be on your fence row. And uh, by the time you get done, we, we have this uh, beautiful plant with a heart-shaped leaf that's covering all the trees and destroying uh, thousands of acres of forest and producing little potatoes. And people actually distributed them in this area because the leaves were so pretty. So, right. Um, yep. I mean, there was that's, why, that's why I call them seductive invaders. This is particularly seductive because if it smells like lilacs, who's not going to be seduced by that? <laughs> or if it's a favorite plant of yours, or if it's just absolutely beautiful, but you have to weigh out the uh, natural damage that it's causing. And as I say here, just say no to cheap and easy gardening. This was another conversation I had today, not today, this past week, with someone um, who... Uh, the church um, that I was at needs some help with the landscaping. You know, landscaping is probably 40 years old and they have zero money with which to do it. So this person was thinking he'd just bring some of his ferns from home to fill in some spaces. Hmm. So we went kind of in, you know, we had an animated conversation <laughs> about that. And me again, trying to explain these uh, commonly called either Boston or sword ferns, you can tell them from the natives if you pull them up and they have these orange balls here. And again, same same issue. So just say no to cheap and easy gardening if it's going to, you know, cause a problem for the ecosystem. Try to find something better and different. And since I am here and I'm from the water department, I also am going to take this opportunity to remind you of your watering days if you are in Hernando County. I know not all of you are, but if you are, we are on one day a week watering. My address ends in one. So my day would be Monday if I watered, which I don't happen to. Um, and it's pretty easy to follow. Now you may be wondering, does this apply to me? So I have one question to ask you, and that will answer if this applies to you. Do you live in Hernando County? Only question that needs to be asked. Does not matter if you're on a private well. Does not matter if you're in the city of Brooksville limits. Um, this applies to you. So pretty easy to follow. Before 8 a.m. or or after 6 p.m., not and. I think I'm going to stop sharing for the moment. See if we have any chat questions. Good morning. Um, oh, let me try to grab this. These things really move around. Show. Okay. Yes, Diana's agreeing. Sword fern. Pull it out and it comes back. Yeah, yep, that's the other name for it. Boston fern, sword fern. The problem with common names is so many of them have it like that mock orange i just showed you also called a english dogwood it's neither of those things but they call a pittosporum bush a mock orange as well because it has a citrusy kind of aroma to it so the you can look up easily the latin name of the invasive uh, weeds or you can walk out and uh, you know outside anywhere <laughs> Pull them up, see if they have those orange balls on the roots, and you know that's what you have. How do you control them? That's a super difficult plant to control. Uh, the, the problem is it, it spreads with spores. So if you have a, a shady area, the, the entire area becomes covered with these spores. So even if you get rid of the plants, 
the ability for this thing to recover and come back still exists. And it, it uh, this, this is probably one that if, if you make the mistake of letting it get any size at all, you probably will never truly eliminate it. Uh, one plant produces enough spores to uh, guarantee that, that there'll be another generation. And, and it just, uh, there, there isn't any good chemical control. It, it's pull it when you see it. Don't ever let it get big. And, and it becomes so thick, it totally wipes out all other plants. In any, any area that this grows in, it becomes a pure monoculture. And, and there's nothing else left. And it, it's, this is a nightmare to control. And as I was saying, what happened was, People, mostly people, moved these plants around. Now, you know, over world history, yes, animals have moved plants around on their fur or they digested it and planted it elsewhere, but not at the extreme, you know, level, you know, not as fast as humans have in the 20th and 21st century. You know, always in history, or we didn't have airplanes or that many ships <laughs> coming in or, you know, cars, you know, people driving from state to state and all over. So that's how these things get spread around. Sometimes intentionally, like Ernie said, oh, they're so pretty. So they didn't, oh, you know, years ago, camphor trees were the thing. Um, I was just talking to... Bill, because he was out at the Chinsigat Conservation Center. There's an ancient, it's dead, but it's a really old camphor tree. You can see it by a chimney where the house used to be. This is not at the manor house. This is at the uh, down the road at the conservation center. So you can see remnants of the old homestead, and that includes an old camphor tree stub. They had it in the front yard. They were showing it off because in the 1800s, you had to, you know, order it from China, send someone in a horse and buggy down to the port of Tampa to get it, and then bring it back up. So it was a status symbol of how rich you were <laughs> that you had this exotic, you know, what they called then oriental tree in your front yard. And now everyone has them and they're in fact, you know, invasive, they're considered on the invasive list. And, only, and as much as you may love yours, you can't deny that you have thousands and thousands and thousands of babies <laughs> that you're mowing over um, from those camphor trees and also the birds, which are eating the berries and then depositing them on your sidewalk and your car. They're also depositing them miles and miles and miles away too. So it may be very, very difficult if you have a very large camphor tree, very costly to try and remove it or anything. On the other hand, um, things that grow quickly are what, Bernie? Usually they're very weak. The, the same thing with the uh, weedy type oak trees. Any, any of those weedy trees tend to uh, break limbs and, and die young. Mm -hmm. after they've made a mess and, and gone on. Uh, Chinese tallow was another one that everybody loved it. It was a, a beautiful tree. Uh, I planted one when we first came to Florida. I've probably taken out uh, maybe 300 of those trees in various parts of the yard. Now, I've only got five acres, so uh, but I've got Chinese tallow everywhere and they still pop up. I've, I've been working on getting rid of that for uh, almost seven years now. Why don't you tell us um, your story about when you moved here, how you, what you moved into, and then how you got interested in gardening? Well, what, what happened was when I moved to Florida, I had never done any gardening at all. And there was a, a nursery, the ARC group had a nursery and I would go over and buy plants and they were beautiful plants and I would put them in the ground and they would die and uh, I went to a couple of the local nurseries and I would buy plants and I'd put them in the ground and they would die and after going through 
probably $5,000 worth of plants in four or five years. Uh, I heard about the extension and a fellow by the name of Klaus ran the extension at that point. And he had a class for beginning gardeners. And uh, I was just stunned at how beginning I was. I, I knew absolutely nothing. But the, the, the one thing I learned out of that was right plant, right place. And that is the absolute most important lesson there is in, in gardening. And so I, I bought plants and, and if I planted them someplace and, and they weren't happy, I dug them up and I moved them. And eventually I found out that by moving the plants that, that I actually had different types of, of uh, areas in, in the yard for different types of plants. And I was... Uh, that was a revelation to me because I, I had never tried that before. And uh, so once I started having little success, then I really got interested. So when I retired, I, I took the uh, master gardener class and the education capability of the master gardener program is fantastic. Uh, if, if you if you take the program and you, and you have a real interest, just about any of the information that the university has is available. So uh, I, I have uh, really enjoyed it. It's become uh, my hobby pretty much. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, uh, I think I've, I've learned quite a bit, uh, to at least Hernando County. And the interesting thing about it is Florida isn't one place that one, one particular area you can garden. There are, there are probably five totally separate divisions of the state. Mm -hmm. and the, the Panhandle, Northern Florida, uh, North Central, South Central, and South Florida. Those are all unique areas. And, and what you know about your area doesn't apply in those other areas. So, yeah. uh, it, you know, plants are an amazing thing. It, it's It's been enjoyable. I've, I've really appreciated it what I've learned. And even, like you said, within your own yard, <laughs> there are different microclimates. And the five acres you bought had been a citrus grove, correct? That's so cool. that poor land had been used up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the, the land has got a, a real high nematode population. There are certain plants that I can't grow because of the nematodes. Uh, Big trees, for for instance, uh, I, they will what grow. What was that? I'm sorry, you went out. But I say big trees are the, the big trees. Big, yes. Uh, yes. They 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 grow fine for the first year, and then after that, uh, they stop getting any bigger, and they they get smaller and smaller, and eventually they get about a foot tall. And I can keep them going at a foot tall, but I can't get them to go any bigger because the, the neven toad population uh, takes the root structure down to that's all the roots that are capable of supporting. So, and, and the other thing about it is that the, the climate has changed here. When, when we first moved here, I had uh, five acres of oranges. Uh, the year that we, we bought the place at, at uh, the end of December, right about Christmas time in 89, we had a big freeze. And what was an orange grove became five acres of dead trees, which I eventually replanted. And now with the disease, I'm down to about four or five legitimate trees. But uh, at one point, I had uh, about 300 trees. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting thing. And, and there again, um, the... Uh, information that's available on taking care of citrus for a homeowner uh, is really valuable uh, and it's all available for free from the university yes and you know we, we have both learned quite a bit um i actually started working you know in a clerical capacity for the universe for the extension office in 99. i had no idea what it was either it's just they you know, I needed a job <laughs> and, you know, um, they had a clerical position. And in fact, when I walked in the first day, I still had in my mind that they were USF 
not UF. So that was, you know, the first thing to learn. They're the University of Florida. And I began to learn what is your land grant university? What does that all mean? What is the history behind that? And then just as people came in asking um, questions of the master gardeners every day, I started listening. I started reading all those publications that were available. And again, you know, it sparks an interest. It really does. And we both have have learned. I continued on um, to college classes and Bernie as all, all his entire life is very, very self-taught and probably one of the smartest guys I know because he voraciously reads everything. And when he decides to learn about a subject, he wants to devour all of that <laughs> subject. So he likes to be challenged too. So if you have any questions, I don't see any questions popping up today. Um, so what do you think, Bernie? Um, here in Hernando County, we do have a fertilizer ordinance. And now we are away from the blackout phase. You're allowed to start fertilizing your lawn. I'm just going to leave you with that. <laughs> what oh, should you do? The, the lawn care thing is, is, is one of those uh, I, I could do, I don't know, probably four hours on lawn care. Uh, it, it's a uh, in fact, we, ha we have a uh, class coming up next week on, on soil that will be online. So Yes, I'm gonna uh, I have that. Yes, I'll show okay. that. But the, the uh, fertilizer, uh, most people want to fertilize wrong. The, the, the commercial people put down real high nitrogen and not much else. Uh, uh, we need no potassium. So... Uh, a, a fertile, the numbers on fertilizer, the, the, the first number is nitrogen, the, the next number is phosphorus, the third number is potassium. I said we don't need potassium, we don't phosphorus, need phosphorus. Yeah. So, if you're the, in Manatee the, County, you've got plenty right now. The, yeah, the, the more nitrogen you put on, the, the faster your, your lawn will grow. And, and for the commercial people, they like a lot of nitrogen because it makes the lawn green and, and the people think they're getting their money's worth. Well, the, the problem is the root structure needs a lot of potassium. So uh, a, a balanced fertilizer where you, you have a, an amount of nitrogen and, and, pot and potassium that are equal uh, provides the, the greatest health for the, the plant. And the other thing you want to do with fertilizer is you want to use a slow release fertilizer. You don't, if, if you just use a, a, a standard fertilizer that's got a, an ammonium salt, uh, you, you give it a lot of nitrogen, it grows like crazy, boom, it runs out and, and it's in a growth mode. The, the plant has sort of a, a, a control that says we're gonna grow and, and even if it runs out of things to, to provide the nutrients that it needs, it continues to grow. Well, it puts it under tremendous stress. So you can actually fertilize the plant and do more damage than if you didn't fertilize because you put it into this growth mode. And if it's all fertilized at one point, uh, it goes into growth mode and it runs out of nutrients and it continues to try and grow and, and it, it damages the plant. So uh, a slow release, uh, fertilizer, something like 15015 or 17017, where the first and last numbers are basically the same. The, the only difference, if, if you know, if you had 505, you'd just use more fertilizer. If you use 2020, you'd use less fertilizer. But basically, those formulations would be the same. It's just the quantity that you use. So the other thing that people do. It, that is a mistake in my mind is they want to use a weed and feed. And, and the, the problem with weed and feed is the um, weed killer that works on St. Augustine lawns kills Bahia. And the, the, weed feed, the weed control product that works on Bahia kills St. Augustine. So if you buy a bag of weed and feed, and you buy it for the wrong lawn, 
uh, you run the risk of, of taking out your entire lawn. So the the uh, and the other thing is, if the temperature is above 85 degrees, the uh, weed control is damaging to the lawn. And if, if even if it's a correct chemical at, at high temperature, it's it's very bad. So uh, and there there. The reason that we aren't allowed to fertilize early in the, in the season is that when you put the fertilizer on, the fertilizer needs to be absorbed by the plant. And if it isn't absorbed by the plant, it ends up in our water system. Well, the, the, the plants wake up uh, in the spring and they start growing and about this time of the year, they're, they're finally absorbing nutrients. Well, if, if you had fertilized in January, almost all of that fertilizer would disappear with the first rain and end up in the water system. So uh, now is a great time to fertilize. And, and if you leave the grass clippings on the lawn mm -hmm. over a season, that's the same as fertilizing a second time. So if you leave the grass clippings and you fertilize in April, you can wait until uh, August, September for your, your next fertilizer application. Only fertilize twice and the lawn will be healthier. It will be a lot happier. It will stand less chance of having disease problems and you'll spend a lot less money. This, this thing of having somebody come out every month and spray a liquid fertilizer on your lawn may be pretty, but it leads to a lot of diseases and it's not really healthy for the lawn. And when you have to replace a lawn resod, you, you find out what the true cost of, of having a pretty lawn that is artificially kept pretty. So that's pretty much my story on fertilizer. But about, you mentioned disease. It, what is the most common disease that you see from Floritan or St. Augustine? <laughs> Number, uh, one, number one disease of Floritam is take all root rot. Take all root take, rot. Yeah, take all root rot. Yes. Yes. Take all root rot is a disease that occurs as soon as the lawn gets stressed. The number one stressor, number one, I mean, this, I cannot stress this enough, is mowing the lawn too short. The uh, St. Augustine. Uh, the Floritam lawn needs a four inch blade to provide uh, optimal or not optimal, but minimal nutrition to the for the root structure. That's that's the the size of, of blade that it takes to maintain a healthy lawn. So if you mow it at two inches, it may look beautiful and you may force it to stay green and and, and fertilize and, and all the tricks water the heck out of it but it's not going to be healthy and the first time there's a problem you will have a fungus infection that'll wipe out the whole lawn so you can do more for your lawn by just raising the mower to its highest setting and mow as high as you can stick a ruler in the in the lawn if it doesn't say at least three and a half inches you've got to do something otherwise you're going to lose the lawn and if it says three and a half or four inches, everything's fine. And and the truth is, if you don't fertilize, the lawn may not be as beautiful and green, but it won't die. If you mow it short, it may look prettier, but it'll die. I mean, it's it's basically that simple. Do you see cases of take all root rot? Sometimes uh, the extension office sees it, but sometimes ten a week. How often do you see chinch bugs while we're on this conversation? Oh, chinch bugs? Um, two years ago, I had somebody bring one in. Um, used to be 15 years ago, mm -hmm. people would, would bring a, a lawn sample in, and I would see a, a, a chinch bug or four or five or six and almost every sample that came in, I, I would see some big eyed bugs and uh, some grubs and every, every lawn sample that came in had some insects in it. 
I would say in the past five years, basically every lawn sample that's come in has been sterile. We have put so much insecticide down that was unnecessary. We've basically killed everything that existed in the lawns. And the sad part about it is we had more good bugs than we had chinch bugs when chinch bugs were a problem. The, the, the earwigs, the, the big eyed bugs, they feasted on those. They're, they don't exist anymore. If, if chinch bugs actually could come back, which they probably can't, there's probably enough uh, insecticide for the next 10 years still in our, our uh, uh, land. But, and the other thing to think of is that all that insecticide is ending up in our drinking water. So if, if you really like the idea you're drinking poison, blame yourself because it, it's the people with these fancy lawns that, that put all that chemical down that really last up a, a, what was a, a functioning system and it, while we're talking about grass let me let me explain about grass well let me wait well let me answer melinda's question okay. here is the watering restriction of one day a week consistent throughout the year that's an easy answer yes okay. it has been that way for about 15 years now it's going to stay that way in hernando county and go ahead bernie okay, okay. by the way with, with the exception of maybe three or four weeks in a year, once a week watering is totally adequate. Uh, the, these people that are cheating it, that are watering every day, that, that's actually, in a lot of cases, not that, that healthy for the lawn. The, you know, if, if you were going to, to actually optimally water. You went out and, and you had uh, water sensors buried in the lawn so you knew what the, the, the percentage of water was in the soil at all times. You'd find that, that other than about four weeks, watering once works great. We, God provides a bunch of water for us occasionally. You know, that, that takes care of a lot of it. Uh, these people that are running the sprinklers uh, while it's raining, uh, they're, they, they just don't understand the, the, the truth is, rainwater has a lower pH and is better for your yard than the city water. And the city water is better for your lawn than well water in most cases. The, the well water tends to have a real high limestone. Sure, uh, because base, of where it comes from, yes. Which, which makes it... Uh, a, a higher pH, high calcium, and it's it's not the the best thing you can do. The best and it's thing a good thing that I don't water is, my lawn. Uh, rainwater, and then supplement it with city water if, if you need to. And right there, you've hit it, Bernie. That is what people have backwards. They think that rain supplements their irrigation system, and it should be the other way around. Well, the, the, the thing that the, the story on grass is we're at 28 degrees north latitude here in Hernando County. And if you take a globe and you go around the earth with the exception of eastern India and some of China, all the rest of that at 28 degrees is desert. So for, for some reason, there is no grass growing anywhere on earth at 28 degrees that's happy grass, that's lawn grass. There's, there's things that will do very well here, but they don't make a lawn. Uh, Kogan grass is a real good example. One of the worst <laughs> things you could have. But it, I mean, it's a grass, but it's not going to make a lawn. The, the, the grasses that produce lawns um, are found farther north and uh, they don't grow here. So what happened was when they put the railroad in, people from uh, the northern New England states primarily would come to Miami and they would look at the sand and they say, it doesn't look like the uh, place I left. I want grass. And they started putting in grass. Well, 
New England had uh, marsh grasses and prairie grasses and, and imported grasses from Europe that, that grow at 40 degrees north latitude and do very well. And, and there had been people growing grass over in uh, um, Europe and Asia that had come to America and, and they brought grass with them and, and they planted it and it did well. So they assumed that and everybody assumed that you could put grass in, in Florida and it would do well. Well, it doesn't. So we, we've gone around and, and looked all over the world and we found grasses that we can kind of make work here. So New England's had 3,000 years of, of grass history behind them, the things that, that work. Florida has had 150 years of trying to get grass going. The university is working their butt off to try and find something that will do well. If you give us 3,000 years, I guarantee we'll have as good a grass in Florida as they've got in New Jersey. Or we'll give Don't up. Man. Don't complain. Yes. Um, Melinda asked, is the watering restrictions for lawns only, or does it include flower beds, gardens, etc.? It's for your irrigation system. That's what the watering restrictions are for. You may stand with a hose to water those other areas um, with a self-canceling nozzle at any time. Um, if you uh, vegetable gardens, if you have like a um, old fashioned hose and sprinkler, you know, you, you can keep your vegetable garden watered. It is mainly for your lawn, but it is for your irrigation system in general. You can run <clears throat> micro irrigation in your flower beds. There's no restrictions on that. And, or even soaker hoses, which I'm not sure if I agree with because it seems to me soaker, soaker hoses can put out a lot of water. Um, so be careful with even micro irrigation, drip irrigation, soaker hoses, because you may be using more than you think. And if you're a customer of a municipality, you may not like the bill that you get. So, you know, just be careful. And the plants don't need overwatered as well. So someone is asking here, what is your opinion on sod? It must be sod versus putting seed down, I guess. Uh, for some of the lawns, sod's the only way you can get to. There, there is no seed for Floratam, for instance. Uh, sod is very, very good. Uh, the, the big problem that happens with sod is that it, they tend to put it down at the wrong time and overwater it and uh, it, it presents some problems. The, the thing about uh, sod is it needs to go on clean, clean earth. So if you're going to sod yourself, you need to clean down to the, the soil. And, and you start out watering it daily because the, the sod has no real root structure and has no way to absorb moisture. As it develops a root structure, it needs less and less water, and and it's important to taper it off. So normally you you would uh, water every day for a couple of weeks, and then every other day for a couple of weeks, and then every third day for a couple of weeks. And assuming that the the sod is is good sod and that it pegs in okay, you can just keep reducing it until you get down to the once a week, and that's fine. Um, too many people tend to uh, water, water, water every day for two months and then they stop and, and it's a tremendous shock to the uh, sod. So it, it, it starts it out wrong. It, 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 uh, you, you really want to develop a, a, a good root structure and you'll do that by uh, slowly tapering the water off. And they, these people that sell sod know that if you don't do that uh, religiously, uh, you end up, you skip four days when you shouldn't have, uh, you damage the sod. It, it, it must be pegged in before you start uh, tapering back. So uh, they tell you to, to, to water it every day uh, for six weeks or eight weeks. That really is too much water. That That's not healthy. 
And it's not good for and the water bill. And if you want to pay Hernando County Utilities a lot of money, you, know, you can follow the, the, the sod people's advice. I put my email here. We do have a variance for new sod. And I will be glad to email you the exact rules that graduated schedule that Bernie is referring to is um, it's, you know, the rules by the, by ordinance for your first 60 days of new sod. It's also what is best to get your sod established. Now this is for if you have resodded more than 50% of your yard. Um, if you just filled in some spots <laughs> with new sod, you're allowed to use a targeted means meaning, again, that old-fashioned hose sprinkler, or you standing there with the hose in your hand, again, to um, get that area established. If you're thinking of seed, in order, like if you, Bahia grass seed or something, in order for seed to qualify for this variance to be watered in, you know, for 60 days, as Bernie just said, you have to take your yard down to absolutely nothing but bare soil and spread the seed around for it to qualify for this variance. Overseeding doesn't, doesn't qualify. So well now what do you feel about seeding in general versus sodding as if, you know, you had a Bahia grass? What are the benefits of either? Well, the, the, if I was 20 years old and needed a lawn, I would, I would use seed. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're starting out and you don't have a lot of money uh, and you don't mind doing a lot of effort, I would seed. The truth is, it's very difficult to establish lawn from seed. Uh, sod is, is the way to go. If, if you're 60 years plus, probably doesn't make sense to even consider doing seed. If, if, if you really want seed to work, uh, the, you, you have to do the little things. That, uh, you, the, the seed has to stay in contact with the soil. So you've got to clean everything down to where uh, you can put the seed in contact. You don't want to bury it, but it'd be nice if you had an eighth of an inch of something on top of it. So uh, you, you put straw seed, work. You, I'm sorry. Would straw work for that? Uh, that it does, but straw isn't isn't the greatest thing. The the, the greatest thing is is to take a, a spreader and, and and put a little dirt on top of it. But it doesn't make any difference if, if, if it's flat ground and, and you put straw or you put a little dirt on top of it or whatever. Then comes the watering part and, and grass seed is very, very, very small. It has zero reserves. When, when you wet it, it starts growing. When it dries out, it dies. That means that you have to go out and keep it wet. And for the most part, that, that means that initially you need to put a little water on it maybe three, four times a day. If, if you're doing this in the summer, you may have to do that six times a day. And, and because it has no roots and it has such a small dimension to it, you don't need a tenth of an inch of water or anything. All you need is a mist, but you have to go out and mist that entire seed bed and keep it with with some water until it gets to be about an inch tall. And at a point it becomes about an inch tall and you start treating it like sod. But it, it, it's it's a lot of work. The, the prep is hard. Uh, and what's going to pop up before your grass pops up? The weeds up. are going to grow like crazy. So you, you're going to, if you want to keep the weeds down at that point, you can't put any pre-emergent, you can't do any weed control because it'll take out your new little grass seeds. So you need to go pull the weeds while you're trying to get this established. But it, you know, it, you're only going to have to do that for about two, maybe three weeks. Well, if you're 60 years old and you're out there bending over uh, four times a day, covering a yard, pulling little weeds and, and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it, you're probably not going to be real happy. If you're 20, well, if you're 20 old, years old, you have a job right. and you, <laughs> If you're 20, you have a job, so you don't have time for <laughs> that, too. Genevieve, Genevieve, who will be joining a uh, rain barrel workshop that I have coming in May, 
wants to know when is the best time of year to seed or does it depend on the seed? Well, the, the best time of the year to seed is three weeks before the rain starts. So that because the rain will push the seed around, right? Yes, you don't want it raining when you start, but you, you need water to get this thing going. So if, if, if you can hit this little time, which means normally the end of May, early June, first two weeks of June, uh, you can get get the grass growing and, and everything works fine if you do that. Do it on uh, Memorial Day weekend. There you go. That's that's a good time. Yeah. Uh, if, if, you, if you do it uh, in the fall, the, the grass doesn't get a chance to become uh, very hardy. And if you do it in the spring, you run into this dry period uh, where we go three or four weeks without any water. So, uh, and and this this stuff has no roots. It, it, it's really critical on water and, and its initial shot. It, the roots are growing uh, at, at the very beginning at about the same rate as the plant is. Then the, the plant takes over, uh, the, the green thing pops up, and the roots are growing slow. Well, you want you want the roots to, to have a, an opportunity to become reasonably sized before their first winter. So, uh, I, I would not I would not seed other than maybe uh, patches uh, later than uh, September at the absolute worst. So you you could do September. After that, it's iffy, and and I wouldn't uh, go before. Uh, right now, actually, this this is a, this is about as as early as I would. Uh, yeah, it's awfully dry. It's going to be dry for a while. I would wait till the end of May, like you said. Yeah. Um, and should you get scarified seed, will that help? Definitely scarified. That that. Um, otherwise, if you just use like wild type seed, uh, it it takes as long as six weeks before it starts growing. Scarified seed all pops up, all starts growing within the first three days. And so. yeah, what that means is it's, the word is scarified, means it's been put through a tumbler and etched so that germination can happen faster. Because yeah. the hay grass has really tough seeds. <laughs> um, Christine asks, what time of year should sod be put down? I would let nature water it for me and do it in the summer if you possibly can. There again, the ideal time is three weeks before the rain seeds. I, I would not put it down any later than September. I, I, I have I seen the window for, for sodding to, to have decent success or, or assured success is is from mid-April to uh, mid-September. Other than that, it's, it's iffy. Right. But I've seen the county put it down, uh, you know, Pensacola Bahia put it down on roadsides. I saw them one day doing it when it was 17 degrees in January. It's going to get watered in the first time with a water truck. And it grew, but it's not what you want your lawn to look like. The, one of the things, since we're talking about bahia, the, there's two types of, of common bahia, the Argentine bahia and Pensacola bahia. And the, the, they're both great grasses. One of them is a better pasture grass. It, uh, bahia Pensacola, actually, Pensacola P for pasture. Pen, Pensacola <laughs> is, is a that's it, all the bahias are pasture grasses. They're they're designed to be. The thing that happens is that what stimulates the the plant to put out seed is for an animal to come along and eat it. So when you mow it, you were the animal that just came along and ate the the grass. It will immediately put up seed. Pensacola puts up probably five to ten times more seed heads than Argentine does. Uh, 
and they do it overnight. So you mow, and the next morning you have a, a whole lawn full of these seed heads. If you've got a pasture, that's fantastic. That keeps the pasture reseeded. Uh, most people don't like the seed heads because you got to mow twice. So you put in Argentine behead, and you don't get as many seed heads. Looks really good. But the problem is each one of those little plants is a grass plant. And if it dies, you've lost a spot in the yard. And because you're keeping it mowed, it's not reseeding. So if, if you want to keep the bahia looking good, you need to mow or you need to reseed. Now the seed's expensive. So what happens is you end up, uh, if, if, if you uh, don't fertilize and you keep it mowed and you leave the clippings on, you, you get this little growth of, of clippings down inside and it's not really a problem doesn't hurt anything but if you try and reseed it keeps the seed from getting in contact with the ground so when you overseed uh, an existing lawn you get really poor coverage of the seed and the and the coverage is crappy to begin with I, there's no denying that well it, yeah it has an open growth habit so it, therefore it, Weeds encroach. I just live with the weeds. That's what I do. But, and now but, that you mentioned the seed, I've gone before. I thought I'm going to follow Bernie's advice, and I've never overseeded my bahia. It's been out there 13 years. I'm going to go get some. And I went to the store, and I thought, No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't that dedicated to it. <laughs> if you don't want to overseed, then let it go to seed. If you if you yeah. don't live in a in a homeowner association place where uh, it, it, it's a problem a couple of times during the seed ahead season just let it go to seed i have uh, a co-worker who does that it. yes uh, it, the way he describes it though it's like you have to like go like this to get through his yard but and well, that's his um justification he, he says he's letting it go to seed cold. yeah yeah so okay i think we're running out of questions here and almost running out of time too. Um, let me see if I can finish sharing what I was going to share. Application window. Nope, that's not what I wanna share. Yeah, you're just watching Go, really. You have disappeared, Lily. There you go. I lost you for a second. I'm back. Oh. I hope you entertained them, Bernie. Um, we just won't worry about that. Sharing what I was trying to share. We do have upcoming classes um, all the time. So if you look on my Facebook page, if you look on the extensions Facebook page, you'll see our list of classes. And um, I have rain barrel workshops. I'm starting to do them twice a month. Once a month um, will continue to be virtual, and that will be a rain barrel workshop and combination compost bin workshop. And if you're wondering how I give you those things through the computer, you uh, you take the workshop on a Thursday evening and then meet me at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery on a Saturday morning, following Saturday morning to pick up the items. You have, you have to be a, uh, resident of Hernando County to get a compost bin because those are free. You don't have to be a resident to get a rain barrel because you do reimburse our cost for those. Those are $50. But if you're emailing me and saying you are quite a distance away, what I will probably do is give you two links in which you can watch a extremely similar rain barrel workshop and an extremely similar compost 
composting workshop so that you're not going to be part of our live class, but you'll get the same information and you, you won't get the items. This is mostly a very local situation. Um, also, I'm going to be starting in person once, but outside, social distanced, um, at the pole barn at the Shinsuke Conservation Center. Um, and those will be at nine in the morning. First one will be April 21st. Next one's going to be May 26th, which is a Wednesday morning at nine because Lily does not like the heat. So <laughs> um, if you want to do one in person then get it right away and go up to a pretty place in the woods, we're, we're inching towards that as well. To find out about that, there's my email. The first step, um, and Genevieve, I will answer you right after this. The first step um, in finding out about a rain barrel workshop is to email me. If you don't email me first, then you're not registered. You won't, you know, I have to send you the information first. And like I said, we have classes every week. We gave a class yesterday on lawns, which covered a lot of what Bernie just told us. In fact, you know, I, I suck a lot of things out of his brain and <laughs> that overseeding one and, you know, how when we mow, we're, we're like the animal eating it and how you should possibly overseed and all that. Um, really good ideas that comes just from our years and knowledge and, you know, things that we have learned. So, yes, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Also, you can find my classes as well as a lot of Dr. Lester's on Hernando County Government YouTube. So some people that don't like to do Facebook, it seems like everyone will get on YouTube. So if you go to Hernando County Government, make sure you put government in there. I have a playlist for Florida Friendly. Bill is working on a playlist for his classes. You can also find those videos on our Facebook pages. So thank you, everyone, and have a good week, and we will see you next week. Thank you very much, Bernie. I will let everybody know Bernie came in to work phone duty today. No matter how many times I told Dr. Lester, have you talked to Bernie, <laughs> he didn't. So Bernie just was told he was doing this today, and I think he did a really great job. So thank you very much. And we will see you all next week.